amongst those two. So good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Mayor David Darkowitz, and I want to thank you all for coming out to uh, this installment of Town Hall Budget Meetings that I'm holding around the city. Um, I also want to um, acknowledge and, and thank uh, city, Ward 6 City Councilor Marianne Marge uh, and Ward 7 City Councilor uh, Eugene Casey, who are also both here this evening. Um, uh, former colleagues of mine on the City Council, and we still also serve together on the Finance Committee. the opportunity to just get out around the city. This is my, this is my third, uh, third of six that I'm doing all around the city. Um, uh, fourth of six. And I have one tomorrow night and I have another one uh, next week as well. So part of what I wanted to do is just give you kind of an overview of the financial pictures of the city, uh, what the issues are, the challenges that we're facing um, as I try to put together my first budget for fiscal year 13. Now I have to Present that budget to the City Council on May 3rd. Um, it has to be a balanced budget. Uh, then the City Council has time to study it, to have hearings on it, and then we ultimately have to vote that budget into place for the start of the new fiscal year, which is July 1st of 2012. So it's the FY13 budget, but it starts on July 1st of 2012. So just by way of background, this is a sheet that will be really hard to read, but I just want to show you the sheet because it's part of the budget for FY12. And it just kind of gives an overview of the entire budget. And, and mainly, uh, it, it shows a $93 million budget, which is the overall city budget. But that includes the three enterprise funds, the sewer fund, the water fund, and the solid waste budget, which are sort of separate enterprises that collect fees, and those fees go back into that. The main budget that I'm going to be talking about, the one that I have to put together, is the general fund budget, which is about $77 million in fiscal year 12, the current budget that we're in right now. That is the budget out of which we fund uh, education, police, BW, and all the other things we do as a city. So that's going to be pretty much the main focus of what I talk about this evening. So I wanted to first go over what are the revenues? How do we collect the money to fund that $77 million general fund? So this is a pie chart. The largest part of that pie is, is, is the red. Those are taxes. That's 60.3%. So those are the taxes we pay. Property taxes, it's excise tax, it's meals tax, it's hotel tax. Anything that we collect in taxes it, uh, goes into that part of the, of the general fund revenue. The next largest is uh, this large green slice, which is 20.8%. That's state uh, aid. That's what we call the cherry sheet. Back before computers, the state used to literally send us a pink sheet of paper uh, where they gave us, this is the money that we're going to give you from the state. Um, and so it became known as the cherry sheet. And even though there's no longer an actual physical sheet, they still call it the cherry sheet. So you'll often hear uh, the governor or, the, or someone referring to giving the cherry sheet numbers to the cities and towns. Uh, and that's an important number we're going to talk about later in the program. The next biggest item is charges for services at 9.1%. That's largely Smith vocational tuition. Uh, so that's sort of a little bit of an anomaly in the budget. And then you'll see interfund operating transfers, that large sort of pink slice. Um, that's 6.3%. Those are some dollars that do come into the general fund from those other uh, enterprise funds that I talked about, water, sewer, and solid waste. That's significant because as we close the landfill, those interfund operating uh, transfers from the solid waste will start to decline uh, a little bit as we move forward. This is our property tax revenue. Uh, this shows you a 10-year slice from fiscal year 2003 all the way out to the current fiscal year of 2012. As you all know, we have Proposition 2.5, so the city is only allowed to raise its tax rate by 2.5% each year, plus any new growth. So this essentially just shows you uh, that revenue we earned from property taxes and how that is essentially followed about a 2.5% increase each year. The yellow line below is showing it adjusted for inflation. Uh, so you will notice that here in 2009, there's a little bit of a, an upsurge in that number. That was the year that the citizens voted on a Proposition 2.5 override and allowed the city to add $2 million uh, to its tax levy. So essentially that $2 million was voted on and that gets added into the base levy. So that's why you see that slight uptick and then it continues from there. This is a 
chart that shows our tax rate um, here in Northampton per thousand dollars, and it compares it to some neighboring communities, where we fit on the spectrum. So you see Northampton is highlighted in red. Uh, our tax rate is $13.35 per $1,000 of value. So when you get your tax bill, you'll notice they've done a calculation based on the value of your property, and then they've multiplied it by this 13.35 per thousand. And you can see we've got Longmeadow, Amherst on the far end of the spectrum, uh, moving right over to East Hampton, uh, sort of a range of tax rates in the, in the various communities. This shows average property values, again, for the current year that we're in. Uh, Northampton is in red. You'll note above the state average is 358,586. That means the average piece of property in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is valued at 358,586. You'll note Northampton is 304,422. And then again, you see sort of where we fit in on the spectrum of these other area towns, including Longmeadow and Amherst, all the way over to Ludlow and Greenfield. This is the average single family property tax bill, again, comparing us to neighboring communities. So in fiscal year 11, we had $4,530. $7 was the state average tax bill in Massachusetts, and you can see where Northampton fits in on that spectrum of communities. Ours was $4,064, and then you can see the range, East Hampton at $3,000 and, and all the way over to Longmeadow, which is close to $7,000 uh, per um, uh, single family property tax bill on average. This is that number that I referred to at the beginning. This is state aid. So when we looked at that pie chart and we looked at that percentage of revenue that comes from the state, so when we pay our various taxes, um, those go to Boston, they use various formulas to then send money back to the towns and cities in the form of aid. That could be lottery money, uh, it could be gas tax money, it could be a range of different things. But the, the important thing to look at here is in 2003, uh, we were receiving uh, over $15 million in state aid each year from, 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 from uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You can then see how it dipped down in 2004. We started to make a little bit of restoration around 2006, 2007. Even when we got to the top of the roller coaster here, we, uh, we never quite got back to where we were in 2003. Again, just the two lines are this is the actual and this is the adjusted for inflation. But then you can see in 2008, 2009, when the world, state, local economies all took a dive, uh, the state aid was greatly reduced. And you can see that it's gone all the way down uh, to 2013 to uh, below 120, uh, 12 million, excuse me. Um, here's a comparison of that, how that's impacted Northampton over that same period of time. So you can see that in 2003, state aid represented 24% of our operating revenues in the city, what we used to run the city. You can see as we move over to 2012, that's now down to 12.7%. So we're essentially, we're essentially cut in half over that 10-year period, the dollars that we received back from the state to help operate uh, our city government function. This is a, uh, a revenue source that uh, has been modified slightly. This is a hotel, motel, and meals tax. It's one of the few other local taxes besides property taxes. And you may recall that in 2009, uh, they took a vote at the state level to allow cities and towns to have the option of raising a local uh, meals tax and also raising their hotel tax on a local basis to try to create more revenue for cities and towns, which we did. And you can see in 2010 and 2011 that we've been able to see greater revenue in our hotel, motel, and meals tax, taking advantage of the many restaurants that we have here in town and the many visitors we have that stay in our hotels and eat in those restaurants. So that's been one bright spot in terms of new revenue that, that the state has allowed us to generate locally. New growth. So new growth is uh, what we think about when we think about new buildings being built, new factories being built, uh, new property essentially coming on the tax rolls that we can then add to that pie from which we draw our <coughs> revenues. Um, when we do the Proposition 2.5 calculation every year, we're allowed to raise our tax levy by 2.5%, and then they let us add in any new growth that occurred during that year. So new growth is rather significant. So 
you can see that in 2003, uh, we were at about 700, a little over $700,000 of new growth in value uh, added to our tax rolls. That went up to a little over 800 in FY 2004, stayed fairly consistent. And then again, you can see in the 2008, 2009, uh, when the housing bubble burst, when credit dried up, um, housing starts stopped, uh, many businesses stopped expanding, you can see that our new growth number dropped significantly uh, in FY 2010. It's made a little bit of a comeback, and actually in FY 2012, we had a very good year relative to those past couple of years, largely a result of the new Cole Morgan facility that was built at Village Hill, which added a lot of new growth, as well as the new homes that were built there as well. But generally, uh, we're projecting for next fiscal year for new growth to be lower than this year. Because again, I don't think we've fully come out of uh, the recession that we've been in. And so people are doing less new building <coughs> as opposed to just remodeling. So here is a, a look at how our new growth in FY12 compares again to those neighboring communities. And you can see at a little under 700,000, uh, we're still doing much better than many of our neighboring communities, with the exception of West Springfield, um, which, uh, which has a combination of a split tax rate and lots more commercial land that they're able to develop, many more national chains that they've been able to bring in uh, to the community. This is another number. It's, a, uh, it's not a large revenue source, but I want to mainly show it to you because it also shows how dependent uh, certain revenues can be on the economy. So this is permit and inspection <laughs> revenue. So this is everything from the electrical inspector, the plumbing inspector, the building inspector, also weights and measures. But essentially, it's another indicator of activity in the construction and housing market. Um, depending on how much activity is going on, the bigger the value of the permits that get pulled that the inspectors work on. And you can again see uh, some fluctuation again 2008 to 2009, some drop off. Uh, 2010, we went back up. 2011, we went back up. Uh, we've come up a little in 2012, but the building inspector is telling us that while we're doing the same number of permits this year, the value of those permits has gone down because people aren't doing additions. They're doing bathrooms. They, they're not doing full scale additions on their home. So even though we're doing the same number of inspections, we're not bringing in the same amount of revenue. So we can't project that much revenue for next year. This is one if you have uh, savings accounts or 401ks or retirement accounts or any other investment vehicle. This is this should be fairly familiar to you. This is our the city's interest, uh, in, um, the interest that we earn on our investments, which is largely uh, money that we keep in in short-term instruments. And so you can see in, in FY 2003 we kind of began a, the ride up the roller coaster to over $600,000 a year um, in interest on our investments when the market was doing very well. And then you can see the, the sort of the, the, the down, going down the other side of the roller coaster when the world economy went south. And so now you can see we're earning just above $100,000 a year in interest on our investments, which when you compare to where we were in 2007, again, that's about a half a million dollar difference in what we're bringing in in revenue on, on essentially the same amount of money sitting in investments. Um, so that's the revenue side of the picture. These are some um, expenditures that I want to talk about, or, or sort of a big picture of how we spend those, uh, those revenues that I talked about. So this is that $77 million pie chart, which is the general fund. You can see we've broken it down into different categories. So the, the largest segment of that is education. That's 38.6%. That includes the vocational and the public school system. You'll see the next largest category, 19.4%, is employee benefits. So that's health care, that's salary, that's retirement. Um, public safety is then the next largest talent, uh, category. That's police, that's fire, that's dispatch, that's parking enforcement. Um, and then you can see the smaller uh, segments of, of government. General government at 4.9%. Um, that includes all the city hall functions, the treasurer, the auditor, the city council, the mayor. Um, you can see down at the bottom here, uh, you've got culture and recreation at 2% of the budget. That's our recreation department. Um, that's our arts uh, commission. Um, human services at 1.3%. That's basically our veteran services department that we, uh, uh, that we categorize 
for those purposes as well as the Board of Health. Um, and then you can see other small uh, parts of the expenditures that we make, but those large ones, and I'll show you another slide right here which, which shows you another look at that. This is taking the education side of our budget, but also including the health care that we pay uh, for education for, for all the staff in education, the debt service that we pay on education, the capital cost for education, and you can see that when you add all, when you factor all those things in, we actually spend 53% of our budget is on education, it's on our schools, um, on this school and, and the other elementary, middle, and high school. And then you can see how the breakdown works for the other, uh, other categories. On that same theme of school spending, this is a number that gets looked at a lot. Uh, this is how much per pupil in grades kindergarten through 12 that Northampton spends on each student. You can see, or you may not be able to see, the state average in fiscal year 11 was $13,371. So across Massachusetts, on average, school districts are spending that amount uh, per student. You can then see Northampton, which is sort of in the middle again of those categories. We spend $12,608 per pupil. And then you can see the full range from East Long Meadow all the way over to our friends across the river in Amherst who spend uh, significantly more um, uh, per pupil uh, than, than our campus. This is taking a look at um, a, another look at those expenditures and breaking it down even deeper, mainly to show that you can see the big, the large red portion is salaries and wages. That's 54% of the budget. If you then factor in employee benefits and insurance, that's another 20%. Um, so that's 74% of our budget is essentially people. Uh, the city is a, is, we're a people organization. We have teachers that teach in the classrooms here in this building and in the schools throughout the city. We have police, we have firefighters, we have clerks and the secretaries, everybody that delivers the services to the taxpayer. So the largest part of what we spend on is the people that make that happen. The operating budget, you can see this 14%, those are all the operating and maintenance costs from whether it's electricity or supplies, et cetera. And then the next biggest number is debt service. So that's the money that we have to pay each year on, on, the, um, on the larger projects that we have to borrow for, the larger expenditures, whether it's the buildings that we have to refurbish, whether it's uh, large trucks that we buy for the DPW. Those are things we can't afford to buy in a single year, so we, we bundle them together and we buy them bond them over 20 years so that we can afford to do that. So that debt service is what we pay <laughs> on those kinds of expenditures. This is just another look at the general fund salaries and wages. Again, breaking it down into the categories. Education is that lower bar. Uh, public safety is the next one up. And then the other ones are those smaller categories, culture and recreation, public works and human services. Our salaries and wages have been fairly uh, consistent over the last several years, really, education and public safety is probably the area where we've seen the most growth uh, in terms of adding positions, um, and some of that is, in the case of education, uh, is a requirement in many cases of special education where we have to add more teachers uh, to fulfill those requirements. So this is another major number, again, that you probably understand in your own lives or in, in businesses or where you work, and that's health insurance. Health insurance is a major driver. And again, this is the health insurance that we have to provide to our employees. So you see here in FY 2003, we were spending a little less than $6 million per year on health insurance. You can see how that number has risen over that same stretch of time uh, to up over um, uh, $9 million in FY 2011. You can see that the average increase over that nine year period has been 6.47% per year that our health care costs have gone up, um, which uh, frighteningly is actually good relative to some other communities and some other businesses where they're seeing double digit increases every year. So I, um, I commend uh, the previous administration. I also commend the employees of the city who've been willing to work with administrations to modify our health plan from year to year, make changes to it to make savings um, in that overall number. Unfortunately, uh, I've, I've come into office at a point where we've done most of the tweaks to that health care plan that we can make. So the initial offer from our health um, 
provider, which is Health New England, for this fiscal for the fiscal year coming up was 12.5 percent increase, which is about 1.2 million dollars that would be added. We'd have to come up with extra for our budget. Um, we've done some back and forth negotiations. We we drilled down into some of the numbers. Uh, we've gotten that number now down to about 8.5 percent increase, which is still about a 950 thousand dollar additional uh, expenditure that we have to add to our budget for FY13. We did, um, we did look at another plan, which was a, a, a plan also offered by Health New England. It was a deductible-based plan. Uh, we had a presentation on that. That would show some, uh, some significant savings over the current plan, but under the system that we have in place, I have an insurance advisory committee, which is made up of all of the employee unions that, that form and are sitting on this committee, and they advise me on health care. So they went back to their membership, they looked at this plan, they studied it, then they voted on it, they came back together as a group, and they made a recommendation to me unanimously that they wanted to stick with the current plan that we have. Um, that the added costs that were going to be incorporated into this new deductible plan uh, were going to be too high, so they wanted to stick with the current plan. So right now, we're looking at that healthcare uh, number, again, at 950000 that we have to come up with in next year's budget. We're still doing a little bit more back and forth, and I have one more call in to the CEO of Health New England uh, to have a conversation, but I can say they were the only ones that bid on our business this year. Uh, so I don't have a lot of leverage in terms of uh, uh, playing one insurance provider off the other. I think we've, we've done a lot to cut, to, to cut our costs over time, so there's not a lot of low-hanging fruit for us to be able to, uh, to absorb. So that's the healthcare number. That's a really significant one, and it's a problem that's in private industry, it's in government at every level, and it's really a national issue that we really have to deal with um, because it's a big driver in, in every sector of the economy. Debt service. This is that number that I talked about where we have to pay money on the debt that we've incurred over time. So this is broken down into actually four, um, four uh, little slices of each one of those years. The top two are monies that come from other sources. So the very top line is debt that we pay off through mainly two sources, the CPA. So when, the, when we uh, borrowed money to renovate, do renovations at Forbes Library using the CPA, the CPA makes those payments every year over the life of that bond. Uh, so, and, and we also have, for example, the Senior Center, which we use Community Development Block Grant money, which are federal HUD monies, to pay that debt service. So those represent the debt that's paid on that top line. The next largest line, that all red line, the second one down, that's actually MSBA reimbursement. That's the Massachusetts School Building Authority. So when we did renovations to Northampton High School, to JFK, um, we went through a program similar to what East Hampton's going through right now as they build their new high school. The state pays 75% of the costs. So we, th those payments that are coming on our debt service, they show up on our debt, but the state is actually paying for that portion of our debt. The ones that are really important to us are this, this line right down here, which is debt excluded, and then this one is levy supported in the budget. The debt excluded, those are the borrowings that we did by going to the voters and asking, can we have an override for purposes of borrowing for a specific project? So the fire station, uh, JFK, the high school, and most recently the police station. Uh, and essentially what that does is it allows us, the voters give us permission to raise revenues in excess of that 2.5% cap to pay debt on a capital project. And that's debt that, that goes down over time over the life of the loan. And so you can kind of see um, how, that, how that has sort of gotten smaller as we paid off different projects. And then you'll see there's a little bit of an expansion in 2013. That's where the police station has now been added into that mix. Um, but that's a number that goes down over time. The really important number um, <coughs> is at the very bottom. That's the money that we have to come up with in that $77 million general fund budget to make payments toward the debt. And again, you can see, again, as we move from 2012 into 2013, that number goes up because the city has to add additional money to pay toward the police station, uh, which is now coming online. 
Um, it's not just buildings, though. That includes, the, the debt that we borrow on includes everything from uh, this year we bought new cafeteria equipment at many of our schools, dishwashers. Uh, we've had to uh, pay for roof projects, boiler projects, any of the kinds of things that you may do around your house, for example, that you may not be able to, you may not have the resources to pay for it, so you borrow all the equity in your home, for example, to do those kinds of projects. So we borrow over time. Uh, speaking of the police station, we went out to bond in February, and I know there's a lot of debate in the community about should we be uh, doing this, should we be trying to do this project during really difficult economic times. We were able to borrow the 19 million, which is the police station, plus a bunch of other projects, at 2.5% interest. So we got a really incredible interest rate. We also enjoyed really low construction costs. So that project is coming in on time, on budget, and it'll probably be cheaper than we could have ever built that station anytime uh, moving forward. So, uh, but we have to recognize that we also have to pay for that when we make borrowings like that. So this is another big factor, particularly on the school budget, a number that keeps going up and up and up every year. This is school choice and charter school tuition. So these are the money when children in our district decide they want to go to another school district, Hadley or East Hampton, or they want to go to one of the charter schools in our area, we have to write a check to that district for a tuition. So in the case of a school choice, it's about, it is, it's $5,000 per pupil. We have to pay that. In the case of the charter school, which is uh, in the green, the, the tuition varies, it's set by the state, but it can be anywhere from 12 to 14 to 15,000 per student. Um, and it's, they use a formula to determine that. But you can see the growth since 2003, where we were spending about $750,000 a year on sending tuition. Now we're up over $2.5 million a year that leaves our city to pay other districts. Now I will say, we also receive money from the schools that choice into our district. But on the school, the charter school one is definitely a growing concern, and it's one where we're sending way more money out. Uh, and, and it's a concern, and this is a problem across the state. Uh, this is just to show a couple areas of our budget, again, that fluctuate from year to year or have seen uh, drastic increases. In red is our snow and ice budget. Um, certainly this year we've enjoyed a very mild winter, so our costs in terms of having to pay for plowing and snow events and, and, and overtime related to that have been good. But then if you go back in time to last winter when we had one of the worst winters, we had to absorb a lot of extra costs. So that's one that's very cyclical. You can kind of see it go up and down. The lower line, which is uh, the yellowish green line, is veterans benefits. Massachusetts has uh, probably one of the best and, uh, program, state program, for veterans, for supporting veterans. And that's a great thing. Uh, but as we've had um, the, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, we've seen a, a large influx of new veterans and veterans coming to Northampton, particularly because we have a VA hospital as well as soldier on it. So uh, you can see again, in fiscal year 2004, we were spending about $50,000 a year in veterans benefits. Uh, now, moving over to FY 2011, we're over $600,000 a year. Now, the state reimburses us in the following year, and they give us 75% back reimbursement. So we get 75% of it back, but we have to put out the full 100%, and we have to budget for it. So, um, that's been one of those issues. If you've watched city council over time, you've probably seen Steve Connor, our veterans agent, come before the council throughout the year to say, I've run out of money. Um, and again, I have, he has to pay veterans benefits to these various veterans under the chapter 161 program of the state. And so we have given him the more money to do that. But it, it has not been without an impact in the budget. The next one is our reserves. This is essentially the city's savings account. We have, we have accounts, uh, one is called Free Cash. Um, we did not make up that name, that's a state name. It's a, it's a really strange name, but that's what they call it. Free Cash is essentially, after a budget year is complete, the DOR comes in and looks at what did you budget for the year, and then they look at what did you spend <coughs> in all your departments. So if we, just hypothetically, if we you know, um, budgeted for $100,000 in budget Y or department Y, and we only spent $95,000, um, then that $5,000 they call free cash, and they certify that yes, indeed, you have $5,000 remaining, 
and that goes into a special fund that the city manages called free cash. And we use that basically to then fill in other areas of the budget where we have shortfalls. For example, those veterans benefits. When we have uh, a shortfall, we take money. I ask the city council, will you allow us to transfer money from free cash into that fund? We also have a stabilization and capital stabilization. Those are two uh, very similar to free cash, although they do require, uh, they're typically focused on capital type projects. They require a higher threshold of support from the city council in order to move money out of that. So it's kind of a higher level of savings. Um, and we actually create that ourselves and put the money in there. Um, this is an important number because again, you can see Going up the roller coaster um, around 06 and 07, we had you know, over $4 million in total reserve dollars. And then you can see as, as the economy and as that state aid began to disappear, we began to use that free cash to then backfill the budget to be able to, um, to, be able to keep the budget afloat as we were losing state aid. And you can see we've made some efforts to put more money back in in recent years but we're still down. Um, I can show you a different chart which shows a comparison. This is that same uh, free cash and overall reserves compared to those other communities. And you can see Northampton has got a little less than $2 million in reserves, which is fairly common in the Valley. But then you can see West Springfield and East Longmeadow have far more in reserves than we have. Again, that's, it's, a, it's a critical number because when emergencies happen, when we have a winter like we had two winters ago when we suddenly found all of our schools had excessive amounts of snow on them and the engineers say you have to get that snow off those roofs before they collapse, we had to hire people to come in and shovel those roofs off and we had to come up with additional money to pay for that that we hadn't budgeted for. Or if other unforeseen events happen, um, like the October snowstorm, or whatever they're calling it, that October nor'easter, uh, where again, uh, power was out, we had a it's just something we couldn't have planned for. We're seeking reimbursement for it, but again, we have to have some money in reserve. It's also important because when we go out to get our, to do that borrowing that I discussed, uh, we get rated by the credit agency. So you've probably heard of S&P, Standard and Poor's. Uh, you've probably heard of Moody's. They're another one of the big uh, bond rating agencies. They rate communities just like they rate uh, uh, companies. They give us a bond rating. And that bond rating determines usually what kind of interest rates we can borrow at. So when we did our last call with uh, Moody's in January, and this is a group of analysts in New York who look at our budget statements and usually do a conference call. I'm on the phone, our finance team is on the phone, and they go through our numbers and ask about all the various factors. How much money we have in reserves was a big issue for them. Uh, they want to know how much you, know, you have sort of for a rainy day in your accounts. They gave us, they let us keep our good bond rating, but they did give us a negative note saying, you really have to watch those reserves and try to rebuild them um, because it shows uh, financial stability and strength. This is taking that same comparison and broadening it to across Massachusetts. And we chose cities and towns across Massachusetts that had similar sized budgets, similar sized communities. So we've expanded it to include Gloucester, Watertown, Marshfield and North Andover and Stoughton. Again, North Hampton's over on the far uh, right, again, just below 2 million, and then you can see the range of what other communities have in, in their reserve accounts. So what are the favorable trends for this year? Uh, we had strong uh, tax collections. We have not had a lot of foreclosures. We have not, we do not have a lot of tax delinquencies in North Hampton. People pay their taxes. Uh, we have a relatively low tax rate compared with other neighboring communities. We've had high property values that have maintained that during the economic downturn. Again, we have an average single family tax bill that's below the state average. Um, we have seen some increases in certain revenue streams, motor vehicle excise, parking meter, hotel motel. We've maintained our excellent bond rating uh, and we've been able to get good borrowing rates as a result of that. We've, we've worked hard to keep our insurance costs down as well as our health insurance costs, although a little bit of an asterisk for this year on that. Um, unfavorable trends. Again, state aid reduction. So in the last four fiscal years, from FY08 to FY12, we lost $3.5 in state aid. The state has cut us $3.5 in aid over time. Um, 
And again, that number, again, as a percentage of our operating revenues, we've gone from 20, the state supporting 24% to 12.7%. Um, we don't have any more room under the Proposition 2.5. Um, the closing of the landfill, again, on that first slide where I showed you the sources of revenue, one of the sources of revenue the general fund gets is money from uh, solid waste, which is the landfill, the water, and the sewer, which does provide some funding to the general fund mainly in compensation for the services that we provide to it, the auditor, the treasurer, um, all, of the, all of the other accounting services that we, we provide to those funds. So with the landfill closing this year, we've had to back out that money. Um, so for example, this year we'll receive about $200,000 less from the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund. Our goal is then to cut it another $200,000 next year to be at zero. So we'll no longer be receiving support from the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund. Interest on investments have been in decline. New growth has been somewhat flat. Uh, there's the employee health insurance number again, where we're going to see an 8.25 percent or $950,000 increase. Um, some of our other fixed costs, such as the debt service I talked about, um, our retirement system. We've had the city has had to pay more into our retirement system because we have to keep it solvent by a date certain. Um, we've also uh, seen that school choice and charter school student. Um, tuition begin to rise, veterans benefits is another <coughs> factor, and then the low reserves that I spoke about. So what's the bottom line? Um, essentially, we're going to see revenues, increased revenues to the city this year of about 2.3 million. So that's the that's what we're allowed to increase by two and a half. It's the state aid that we've been told we're going to get, and it's other areas where we think we're going to see increased revenue. Our expenditures are going to increase by about 2.65 million. And again, that's the healthcare number, that's the debt service, that's all the other things that we feel we're going to have to spend more on in order to keep a balanced budget. So that left, that leaves us with a gap of about $350,000 here in the closing weeks of my budget cycle. Um, last week, the House of Representatives announced that they were going to give additional monies to cities and towns. Some of it they were going to give in education aid, some of it they were going to give in, in general aid. I made the decision last week to take of that new aid, 213,000 of it, and direct that to the schools and to Smith Boat. Uh, the largest uh, sort of source of it going to the schools, 208,000. And the rationale for that is the school uh, department has been, is, is also facing a significant deficit they've been concerned about having to make layoffs, and I want to try to help them stave off some of those layoffs. So we've moved, I've moved in my budget projection an additional 200 plus thousand <laughs> over to the school side, which then brings my gap on the city side back up to about 563,000. So we've asked all of our departments to submit level funded budgets. My finance director and I have been meeting with every department uh, going through their budgets line by line, trying to find savings. We have, um, I'm planning uh, as part of some reorganization of different departments to probably eliminate as many as three to four positions on the city side in order to get that number down uh, to the 563. And obviously since about January when we knew this trouble was coming for the current fiscal year, I've implemented a essentially a spending uh, and hiring, not a freeze, but an advisory. So any expenditure over $250, I've been reviewing personally and signing off on since January um, to make sure that we are spending what resources we have in the current fiscal year wisely because again, that free cash number that we talked about, um, if we come in under budget this year, that free cash money is partly money that we can use toward the FY13 budget but again, it also addresses that reserve problem. So right now, we're looking at about a $563,000 budget gap, um, which we're going to continue to work to, 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 uh, to narrow down. So as just sort of public discussion points, what I've been asking folks at these meetings are, first of all, what are the programs and services that you think should be our top priority in a fiscally constrained budget? What suggestions do you have for reducing expenses? Um, what ideas do you have about increasing revenue? And then just any other comments and questions. And again, these are just suggestions, just as a conversation starter. Um, and 
I would uh, open the floor to folks who have questions about anything I've presented or just any other ideas or questions that you have. and everything, the trees are starting to come down, and the land is starting to move. This gentleman's house right here is getting water, it backs up into the back door. What is it? <clears throat> we get a hard rain because it doesn't drain, because of the drainage problem on the other side of the cold. So they, they fill that all in over the years. They used to dry out, they used to maintain it, they used to clean it. So after a while, you can't get in there anymore. Water there permanent. With the water going in, and Chris's house also has it over there. There's mildew, there's moisture in there. He has two young children, this young man here. It's a health problem for the kids and for the adults. Yeah, they can't even tell you and in the backyard, you can't. I can just about walk in the backyard during the summer anymore because of the water problem. I don't know for sure, but I know these houses when they were built, they were built too low. So there should have been another foot or so up on the foundation because the water table, the water table approximately about a foot down below the concrete floor. So as soon as you get a rain now and it doesn't drain like it used to drain, the water just backs up in the yards from this side of the fire. And it used to drain a lot better, but in some cases, it's actually right. a back and dry um, that influx of water and is done. I didn't it's know. Up just to I didn't know about that. Is it uh, insufficient to put that level of water? The water that's coming in now is way, way too much for that to handle because it's so all been filled in over, over the years on the other side of the road. It's almost flat with the road. So they come over and pick out a three foot or a four foot culvert. It's over 75% filled with dirt. So that won't drain now. So that water level gets up to that point, which means the water comes back into the yards. Myself, I'm fortunate these people are. When they have to call in the, the city to come in and pump them out because the water is too much. And we all have
if you, uh, the water's going the wrong way. I find out we just got that pipe now that's going in from across the road here. It's a dead head, and the water is just forced in there, and it blows off the top of the manhole. I mean, that's a question. That's water. And it's got to go somewhere. And that's just one thing after another. The design of that ditch was supposed to be for natural runoff. Yeah. Natural runoff. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So we have a process called the capital improvement process, which I think you are familiar with, where we take all of these various capital needs, and there's a committee that tries to rank them and figure out how we spend what limited money we have each year. I will say the capital program this year, uh, we've done it in the fall of the past. Last year we moved it to the spring. I'm going to move it back to the fall because of this uncertain budget that we have in front of us. We don't, we don't, we really don't have any capacity to do a capital improvement program this spring. Want to see what uh, what happens after we close out the FY12 year? How much money we have available that we may be able to put into the capital program? So that would be an option. We appreciate it. I mean, we yes. just came forward because you are doing the budget. Yes, understood. And we wanted you to know that we have been waiting very patiently mm -hmm. for over 30 years. <laughs> I understand. And we're. If I, heard, if I had a time machine, we could all go back to then, and I would know we could deal with that person that was. Building that swale and that. But I can tell you this is a problem all across our nation where we have inadequate stormwater systems that were not well designed, they were not well maintained, and they didn't take into account some of the growth that happened all around the city. Uh, and there's going to be a, you've probably heard of this company, Camp Dresser and D, which is a big engineering firm. I know they've done some work up in your area. Especially when we see the crazy weather we're having, where we're just having more and more rainfall. Well, not so much this spring, but we've been having these floods uh, in October. Uh, so I think the weather situation around the country has exacerbated the problem in many cities we have. So, so thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Oh, sure, sir. Yes, sir. Oh. They've had their hands up for quite a while. Okay, thank you. constantly bring up Boston Circle and, and several other areas of drainage in the city. And we are working diligently on coming up with a plan, which also includes something called a stormwater enterprise fund. Somehow to put some money together to do this because you've seen what has happened in the budget uh, from the state to the federal government. We used to get 1% of the federal government for our total budget. Now we're down to about 0.6%. So that continues to collapse also. There, the reality is there is no money to go out and start putting storm drain. Storm drain is the most expensive utility that you can install. And there is no, there really, at this point, are no funds uh, The director of the public works is really working on a way to come up to fund these repairs for the storm water. But, and I'd be glad to talk about it with anybody, but I, I really want to keep this as a budget hearing, and there's a lot of people that have a lot of questions that they can talk about, too. So, uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you all. So I, I saw your hand, but then I told you had a hand up. Okay, yeah. Ma'am. Well, I'm Cynthia White. I moved to this area, to this ward in December. We actually did not buy a house on that very property in Austin Circle that we looked at because of the culvert problem there and the, and the flooding. But we did stay within the ward, and so our tax money is going towards this ward, so I hope that the neighbors do appreciate that. Um, my concern would be that the priority that I would have would be public works based on some other concerns that we had, including road pavement. I did see an article in the paper about uh, a backlog in payment for road paving, so that would be my, one of my priorities. Um, reducing expenses, I can't say that I have any except maybe still looking at that whole health issue. Um, I would be in favor of some different measures of increasing revenues, including some of the parking and meter type uh, increases, or um, I don't know what it would take in terms of property, because you talked about that 2.5% cap, but you know, I obviously understand the budget deficit and realize that we all have to play a role in increasing the revenue. So that's all I have. I mean, your point about public works is, is a good one, because we do, you know, we have, over time, as we've had these tough budget years, we, we really decimated
permitting issues uh, around stormwater, around um, around our, our our dam system and our um, levee system, solid waste. I mean, you just name it. They, it's a very complex system, and it's and it's one of those areas where I'll give the Board of Public Works and the DPW a lot of credit, though they've been trying to do long range planning. They've been trying to say, look, we have these systems that were built by our forefathers mm -hmm. uh, who, who made really great investments to build these systems. Now we have to figure out how do we sustain them in the future. So they're doing a lot of these kinds of studies. Um, and so in terms of raising parking, uh, we did uh, downtown, we doubled most of our parking uh, meter rates last year for the FY for the budget that we're in this year. We also raised our parking ticket fines. Um, I'm having a, uh, a bit of a dialogue now with the city council. I'm trying to raise one other permit fee. Um, but again, there's sensitivity to that because mm -hmm. there's other issues around well, is it going to affect Thank downtown? Is it going to affect people who work at those downtown? So that's the tricky part is how you find the tipping point when you start to raise those fees of are you going to have, start to have a negative impact? Right, right. Um, so that's, but your points are well taken. Well, I have a planning degree, so I'm, I'm pretty knowledgeable about all these town issues. So um, I definitely appreciate all the answers that you're giving tonight. I, I see very clearly that you're being very honest and transparent. I think you just applied to the city board. I so did. Like, that's my application coming today. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> so I have one more hand over here, then we'll move back. Um, oh, sir. Since you're talking about the parking, I just want to say that I, I would urge you not to um, apply fees for the first hour in the, in the downtown parking garage, because I think that would be counterproductive to shopping downtown. Okay. But I also wanted to ask, is there a way of um, seeing any savings from using civilians instead of police to direct traffic around construction sites and road work? Because um, I know that's a major expense. And the last thing is, um, is there any effort on a statewide basis to address the problem with charter schools getting so much money from local public schools? I, I think that's a very big issue. Okay. So um, on the issue of the first hour, I know that has been raised and during this recent debate about the parking uh, pass fee that I proposed increasing. Um, and interestingly, there's a bit of a disagreement. The chambers, well, some chamber members have said get rid of the first hour free the business improvement district has said don't do that. Uh, so there's not even agreement in the business community. We did that, I believe, a couple of years ago. Other cities have done that as a way to try to get people to park in the garage, to use the garage, with the idea that if you offer the first hour free, most likely they're going to park there and they'll probably stay more than an hour, they'll shop, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll add to our local economy. So I have not proposed doing that. I am doing a pretty much an overhaul of the parking department. So you may have read about it. We are looking at a lot of these uh, issues that have not been looked at in a while in terms of how we're pricing parking, how much we're charging in different areas, um, because we want to make sure that we're charging a fair price, but we also want to make sure that we also generate the revenue that we need to support that system. So the other 
question you asked about uh, sort of parking and then the state charter school issue. So this has been a source of debate. Um, and again, I, I, I want to be clear, this is, a, these are, this is an option that's available to, to people in Northampton and across the state. Um, and many parents have chosen to, to go into charter schools, um, including friends of mine, neighbors of mine that have done that. Um, there has been a discussion about how the system is funded, because the way it's funded is essentially they take the money from the school districts from which those kids go leave from. Um, and there's been a debate about the fact that, you know, we don't actually have, school committee doesn't have oversight over those funds, we don't have, they're essentially schools that are chartered by the state, and the state charters them and sets them up. So there's been a debate about, well, maybe the state should just create a separate line item in the state budget for funding charter schools, right. and just pay them directly. Um, others have said, well, then they're just going to cut their money to put it there. But I would argue that then at least the cost would be borne by all 350 not just by the Northamptons who have four charter schools around us. Um, the charter schools obviously like the system that they have now because it's reliable. The state sets a tuition and they know that that tuition is guaranteed. No matter how much money we get in Chapter 78, they are guaranteed that tuition rate. So, you know, it's a bit of a battle, but we've tried to make it respectful. Last year, we actually had a joint committee of the school committee and the city council. We brought people in from the Hilltown Charter School our superintendent, and we kind of had a conversation about some of these issues. And they made good points, we made good points. There are some bills in the state legislature to reform that funding structure, um, but right now I think that there's enough charter schools and enough support for them that I think it would be difficult to change the formula at this point. Um, so we've argued for you know, trying to give us more school aid just overall, so that there's more to support both public schools and the charter schools. But it's a, it's a contentious debate. Yeah. Well, I mean, personally, I think there should be a separate funding stream for the charter schools. And I don't know if there's an effort among mayors or anybody else to, to support that kind of legislation. But. Well, there, there is legislation, and I know last year a couple of towns in the area uh, did some resolutions supporting that. That's actually how we started that conversation that we had. We talked about doing a resolution in Northampton. We had a meeting. Um, and it actually was productive because for the first time we had charter school folks coming to meet with our superintendent. He has since taken all the school principals up to the charter school to see what they're doing up there, to understand their curriculum. Because a lot of kids move back and forth between the charters and the regular schools. You know, I know the superintendent will tell you that they don't have any smaller classes than we have in Northampton. He feels that we have just as strong a curriculum as the charter schools. Um, so uh, that's, it's an ongoing debate about this issue. And I know it can be very divisive in this um, We've tried to not make it divisive, but we've also tried to let people know that if you're going to continue to take more and more from uh, the main public school district, I think it does start to cut into the quality of the, local, of the main school district. And my last point was about paying civilians instead of using police. Yeah, I know that the governor had enacted a policy last year for flaggers on the, on the state jobs um, you know, I don't know that it's so much of an issue for us in Northampton. We tend to do, we do have a police that do road details. It's sort of, we don't, it's sort of uh, absorbed by the city to do those details. I don't think we send our folks out to state road jobs per se. I can look into that and find out what we're doing on that. Um, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's as, as much an issue as it, as it is on the, um, like on the Mass Pike, uh, you know, where you see the guy who we're, we're, uh, we don't do that quite as much here, and we do have some flaggers for the DPW, for example, that do some work. But it is, it's a safety issue, so we do have to provide some kind of a flagger. But I'll look into that, like, and I can try to get back to you. If you give me your name afterwards, I can tell you exactly what, our, what we're doing and what we're spending on that. Uh, sir, and, and I'm not sure which of you had your hand up first, so I'm okay. so
Smith Boat. That's now a solar field where we have uh, rows and rows of solar uh, panels that are now generating uh, electricity for Smith Boat, but also giving the city back uh, credits, energy credits, that we're then going to reinvest in more energy related projects as a way to save money. And we've been doing a lot of features around the city to try to reduce our overall. We've actually moved all of our buildings off of oil. Prioritization. I mean, I, you know, I have two kids in the schools. Um, one's going to start at the high school next year, um, and, and so I do. I, I understand what the superintendent is saying about investing in the schools as a way to keep kids in the in the school district, not have them leave for other towns. I appreciate that. I understand that. I'm trying to do what I can do within the constraints that I have um, to try to put more money above and beyond what I'm giving other departments to the schools. But I'm limited by you know what I get from the state, what I get from revenue, what I'm allowed to raise in local revenue. So you know we're we're going to have to try to work through that. But I, I, his overall point I think is well taken that you have to make investments, and I think we've seen that with the high school, where there were years where lots of kids were leaving the high school for other options, mainly because we weren't offering some of the high level courses, we weren't offering theater, we weren't offering. So we really made an effort to put money into those programs. The high school, we now have to also invest in the elementary schools and JFK. But again, it's difficult when you have these kinds of budgets year after year. Um, I mean, the state, the House of Representatives last week, uh, you know, were popping champagne corks because they're going to give every kid $40 extra a year next year. I'm thinking, wow, you guys give yourselves a big pat on the back for that one. Uh, you know, that doesn't really help us when we're facing these kinds of deficits. So we really have to look fundamentally at the way that we fund these things. Some of you may have seen an article in the newspaper today, didn't get a lot of coverage in the Gazette, there's a little story about it, but a commission that was set up by last year's budget process just released a big report, and it's called, it's a report on what's called the tax expenditure budget. This is a little known part of the state's budget uh, where they basically have to itemize all of the tax breaks or tax giveaways that they give to various companies, industries, uh, film industry, this manufacturer, that manufacturer. It totals $26 billion uh, in this particular budget year. Um, just as a reference point, the state gives to every city and town in Massachusetts about $5 billion combined. Um, so this committee looked at these, basically said, no, these tax breaks have just been added on year after year. No one's really looked to see if they actually are working. Are they really doing what they're supposed to do? Uh, there's no sunset provisions on any of them. And so they, they sort of made an opening commitment that they really need to look at these and figure out a way, if it's not working, get rid of it. Because that's money we could be investing in cities and towns as opposed to you know giving to the film industry because we think Massachusetts is going to be the next Hollywood or whatever the, the rationale is. Um, I'd rather invest it in kids uh, and let them be the next entrepreneurs, the next business people. So we need to do a lot of work at the state level because, again, we're so limited at the local level by what we can do financially. But your points are well taken. Did I answer all of them? Yes, okay. Yes, sir. Thank you for your patience. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Mayor, for a very uh, clear and very articulate explanation of the financial situation of our city. As someone who's lived here for quite a long time, both of us, my wife and I, what Northampton does in the field of education. We are now living on what I'm sure others will recognize as a term of fixed income. And as such, we have concerns about <laughs> city expenditures, uh, national expenditures, etc. I just wonder if you might not want to sharpen your language with uh, help New England a little bit about health care because we have both had to take deductibles in order to pay for our health uh, expenses as individuals. Yeah. I'm not saying that this is what ought to happen to teachers or to city employees, but given the fact that individuals do not have the clout that a mayor or a city does, I would hope you would use every bit of your power to try to reduce the cost for health um, insurance for city employees for next year. That's number one. Number two, just as an aside, um, over the past five years, I think I've had slightly over $1,000 worth of expenses due to the pace of 
his birth, put him in his row, so that we don't get many centuries. <laughs> and in the meantime, uh, I do not recognize any uh, changes in the construction of that row, and would hope that we would not have to constantly deviate to Vine to get into the city without further damage to our town. Thank you. Thank you. Um, great, great question about the health of England. Uh, just to give a little more elaboration on that deductible plan. So the other plan that was offered um, was a more, it was a, it's a new kind of a hybrid plan that they developed. They call it the uh, Essentials 500 plan. I recommend it. You're, you're familiar with it. And so uh, what I'm faced with is, though it, was, though, though it would yield some savings to me in terms of my budget gap, range of about $400,000 savings. Um, under the collective bargaining laws that I have to operate under, if I were, I can, I can override the decision of that committee. It's a recommendation that they make to me. I can override it and say, thank you for your recommendation, but we're going to go with this other plan. I then have to bargain the impact. Uh, I have to then bargain with all of those units and have to come up with some way to, because it's going to increase their cost. So, so that's the that's the difficulty in the calculation that I've had to make, and given the differential and the uh, what I think I would be able to bargain, uh, I I've made a decision that it's probably not going to yield the savings at the end of the day. Um, but it's but your point is well taken, and I uh, again I've had at least two conversations on planning authority with the CEO of Health New England this week to talk about you know wanting to he wants to keep our business. Obviously, they're owned by Bay State, um, uh, and so I want uh, him to try to work with us to try to get that number down even lower. So we're going to continue to work on it. But your your point about that is well taken. The road situation, again, this is one of those infrastructure issues where the DPW has done a full kind of inventory of our roads. They estimate we have about a $25 million backlog in projects to fix the roads that we have in disrepair. Uh, we get in Chapter 90 money uh, in anywhere in the range between 800 and a million dollars a year for road projects. Um, so what that's left us with is each year we get to do about one or two roads with the amount of money that we have to budget for that. So last year we did Con Street. This year we're doing North Street. Um, we did put more money in the budget for next fiscal year uh, to add city money to that state money to try to ramp up to be able to do more road projects, but you're absolutely right. I mean, this is part of that larger infrastructure issue, whether it's water, sewer, stormwater, where we've had years and years of deferred maintenance, and it's the same at the state level, the federal level, um, and it's a problem because I've sat on the Plains Committee, uh, which is where people go and they get flat tires from those potholes uh, that they keep telling us to fix, and we don't have the resources to fix them, or we can't keep up with that. Um, so again, it's one of those infrastructure things that we have to come up with a long-term plan for how we address it. Um, and, I, and I was actually just at a regional meeting last a uh, couple of weeks ago that the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission hosted, where they had regional leaders, they had the transit committee, they had the uh, state DOT officials, and they were really saying that as a region, Western Mass has really been short-funded in terms of the kinds of transportation dollars that we need to fix our infrastructure. Most of the money uh, that, that, that gets paid into these gas tax, for example, goes to the MBTA in Boston, um, or it's gone to fund the big dig and to pay for debts on the big dig. Um, so a lot of money has been sucked out of Western Mass. So we've been, there, the, the, the initial kickoff of a conversation to talk about, should we as a region seek funding uh, or some kind of a revenue stream here as a region that we could say, look, we're going to dedicate this to regional projects. Um, other parts of the country have done that for things like high-speed rail, um, where they've actually come up with a regional kind of uh, a revenue stream that they can then work on projects regionally. So it's a part of a bigger problem, not just in Northampton, but, but across the region. So thank you. Are there other questions? Hi. Um, so I was thinking about the new, okay. <laughs> the new growth um, that you were talking about. Um, and so I attend the planning board meetings uh, quite often. And so I know that they've been looking at the city holistically and changing a lot of the zoning laws to try and encourage that. But And one of the big projects was King Street. 
um, and they changed it so that they could hopefully increase businesses. But I was wondering what the other, uh, what other uh, efforts the city is trying to do to solicit businesses into that area, which are also not damaging the downtown businesses. Because, and then also, specifically, um, in downtown Florence, the intersection that has the gas station, or used to have a gas station, there is no business there. Um, and it's an eyesore, and it also hurts that area, I think, in general, just because, uh, you know, the hooligans from JFK come down there and they play. So what also is the city I doing? Those hooligans. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what is the city doing to, I know there was a project that was proposed there. It didn't really work for the area. It was also, uh, the planning board thought it would endanger a lot of the kids that do walk around there. Um, although they're hooligans, we don't want them hit by cars. Um, so <laughs> what it is that we can do to bring a uh, business in there and then also King Street. So. Yeah, so the, um, the mobile station in the center of Florence, uh, they, there was a proposal by uh, Cumberland Farms, who also has a current location, to do a rather major redo of that and put in a gas station, convenience station. They were going to buy an additional lot behind, tear down a house. They went to the planning board. Uh, there was a public hearing on it. There was actually quite a bit of discussion from business and residents of Florence who weighed in and didn't really think it was the best plan for that particular intersection. Weren't convinced that the traffic situation would be handled well by it. Um, and the planning board ultimately uh, uh, voted to, to not allow that plan to move forward. So I don't know. I know that they've withdrawn and they're going to now uh, reassess but again, I think the, the, that's an example of, yes, we want to encourage development. We don't want to see sites like that laying fallow. Uh, because again, that's, that's revenue that we're, that's tax revenue that we could be generating from the site. But we have to balance that against the decisions about what's in, what fits, what kind of development fits where. And I think there was a concern, particularly in that section of Florence, where you have many historic buildings, where you have that traffic area there. Was that site the way they were going to construct all of that on the site, including issues about water runoff, snow removal, there were a number of issues uh, that ultimately the planning board made that decision. They're an independent body that are set up to try to make those judgments. So I'm hoping that someone else will come forward uh, to do something with that site. Um, in terms of what the city can do, uh, we have been, I, I meet with business folks all the time. I meet with bankers, I meet with uh, developers. Um, I'm about to name one of the bodies that I put together, which is various sectors of our local economy to help advise me on some of those issues, um, as well as how we can do a better job of doing outreach to different industries that we want to attract here in Northampton. I think you're seeing on King Street a lot of exciting stuff starting to happen there for the first time in a while. Um, many of you have probably talked about the old Price Chopper site, which has been laying fallow for many years. We're now seeing shovels in the ground. They're uh, rehabbing that facility and they're going to be bringing in new tenants. Firestone has recently expanded uh, their business. They're there. And then I believe Greenfield Savings Bank will begin construction uh, on the right-hand side of that entrance way soon. I just met with the president of People's Bank the other day. They're going to be moving to King Street and putting in a branch. So we are starting to see some activity as the economy improves. And I think also as a result of Northampton really trying to look at its zoning ordinances and try to strike a balance between um, uh, making sure that we protect the things that we're concerned about, the, the environment, the neighborhoods, all the other traffic impacts, but also recognizing that when we do these budget presentations every year, that revenue is incredibly valuable. And it's really one of the only ways that we can, beyond property taxes, that we can raise our the overall size of the pie, which is by expanding the commercial tax uh, base and also relieving some of the pressure on residents and their tax bills. So um, this is something that we think about and talk about, and I strategize not just locally, but I meet regionally with other mayors to talk about regional economic development and ways that we can try to attract businesses to the region. So it's a great point. Um, did I get all of your questions? The, the gas station plus the just the larger issue? Yeah, well, okay. what sort of businesses or industries are you targeting for King Street? Well, it's in terms of targeting, when we did the recent re, well, I say we, I was on the city council and voted for it, 
but we, when we redid the King Street zoning ordinance, one of the things we did was we increased flexibility for the types and kinds of businesses that can come in there. Um, before, it was kind of a one, one size fits all. The entire length of King Street was zoned as one homogenous street. We actually broke it up into three more uh, different zones. Uh, the one closest to downtown Northampton, we created flexibility for the types of development that's more akin to what's happening in downtown Northampton. We then created kind of a mid-range zone. And then at the farther end of King Street, where the price chopper is, we did a more traditional uh, zoning for that kind of a business, highway business. So we, we lifted the restrictions that had been put on about seven or eight years ago, which restricted where the parking could be and where the building had to be located, um, because I think people felt that that had been inhibiting development. So we have opened up the range of different uh, uh, types of businesses that can go on the King Street, and we're hoping that's going to help. And again, we've also tried to uh, meet with people, keep an inventory of these sites, and as we talk and hear from different developers, try to show them, put them in touch with uh, the realtors that are, that are marketing those sites. I met specifically with uh, officials from EPA about a couple of our sites, our DEP and EPA, because a number of the sites on King Street have environmental issues. Uh, the folks at People's Bank were telling me they wanted to build this branch a couple of years ago, but it got delayed by several years because of contamination because of the former gas station site that was there. So that delayed it. The old Blight of Ford or Northampton Honda site, one of the things that has really restrained that site is environmental contamination on the site, uh, which has created issues for people that want to go in there and do things with it, um, the additional cost of cleaning it up. So we've been looking at, are there incentive programs or grants that we can get from the state to help us help a developer that wants to address those issues. Um, so those are, that's the kind of stuff that I'm trying to do um, uh, to try to recruit businesses here in the area uh, and show them what we have to offer in terms of the amenities, the school district, the transportation system, everything else. So uh, that's what I'm working on. Yes, sir. Uh, quick question about uh, the train being out of the North Northampton. Mm -hmm. Will that have the effect of a uh, revenue enhancer for the city, uh, the multiplier of business activity? And I, 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 I certainly hope it does. And, and we're, again, that's another one of the committees that I'm putting together. There's a rail advisory committee. I've gotten now nominations for the two neighborhoods that are affected by the train in Ward 1 and Ward 3. And we really, so for those of you who don't understand, there's a project called the Knowledge Corridor Project, which is an effort to kind of restore the historic passenger rail line that used to follow the Connecticut River and come up from Springfield through Holyoke, through, Green, uh, through Northampton, through Greenfield, all the way up. Many years ago, when the track fell in disrepair, it kind of got diverted. Um, over around to Palmer and Amherst and that area. Folks in Amherst aren't happy uh, that they're going to be moving the train back, but what they're saying is that it's going to uh, shorten the amount of travel time between the various cities and allow them to be able to restore <coughs> inner city rail service between those cities. So Connecticut, they're doing a lot of infrastructure work in Connecticut. Uh, the, the Mass DOT has its own rail division. They're doing all the work here and up and down the Connecticut River Valley to look at what improvements have to be made at signals, at intersections. Uh, we're going to figure out a way to make sure the bike trail is protected and also goes under the tracks so we don't have people who continue to walk their bikes over the tracks. Um, but I do think it has potential. It has potential for people that, that already work up and down the valley and are driving to Hartford or Springfield to be able to take the train. I also think it affords an opportunity for tourism here, uh, spend a weekend in the city. Um, uh, it also possibly allows people that want to commute. Uh, you know, that, uh, we have a lot of companies, we have companies in town that, that have a customer base all throughout New England. And often have, Cole Morgan's a great example. They have a worldwide customer base. Um, and, and so having a transportation network that includes rails just gives them that many more options. Um, and I also think it's going to reduce congestion in the region another reason why uh, they're really looking at reviving rail, because when people get out of their cars, and I was meeting with a delegation, actually who happened to be here today, they were from all over Europe, they were here um, on an exchange program, and they were talking about rail, obviously in Europe, rail has been light years ahead of us, um, and they've really learned how important it is for moving people, and so we were talking about the new rail program, and, and, uh, and they were kind of joking a little bit, that we were 
catching up to them finally on that, that we've not become so dependent on cars. So I think it's got great potential, and I want to try to figure out how we can maximize that uh, to moving goods and services and people up and down the valley. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Is this yes. plenty for long-term? Well, one of the things that one of the things we're going to look at as well, which is a, is, which is something that many communities have gone to, which is this sort of this idea of a multimodal facility. So you may have seen that with Greenfield. They just recently completed a new multimodal facility where they have the Franklin Transit Authority is now headquartered in the same building as their train station. They have a regional planning office. Um, I know some of the students. Oh, we do. Go, go to uh, Montreal. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, or New York. Or, yeah. Yeah. But if they have to come over here, they have to worry about the internet and funds. Yeah. So one of the things we're going to do on this committee is we are, and I've already talked to the head of the PDPA, is really work with them because as that train service moves back over here, we want to make sure we have connecting routes with the PDTA so that when you get off that train, there's a bus you can get on, or there's a taxi stand, or there's zip cars, or there's uh, a way that you can get around the city. So that's, that's an important one. Uh, we're hitchhiking. Yeah, exactly. Oh, sure. Hi, Lee. Hey. Uh, you're blocked by the iPad. I know, I know. I said that to her. <laughs> um, okay, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, is it possible, I don't know if it is, to do any kind of a regionalization of healthcare so we could maybe kind of work with these other smaller communities to then have a bigger negotiating power with the health insurance companies? Um, also, I know Amherst was very successful with able to, able to do an override to actually do their roads. I know it's been a big issue tonight. Um, I go to every Board of Public Works meeting. I know that they would love to have the money to fix all the roads and it's just not there. So um, I didn't know, you know, we have a, there's a great organization in the community called Yes Northampton that seems to get everybody, you know, ready. And I, if there was one thing that I think that the community would get behind, it would be to repair our roads. Um, and then my other question is, you kind of brought this up, but you talk about tourism. But the question is, what are, what, what are we doing for tourism? And, in, and again, is there any way to sort of try and do a regionalization of trying to draw people into Western, in, into our area of Western Mass, not to the Berkshires, but to our area of Western Mass to pull people here and, and you know, bring people in that would help increase that? I don't know if that's something that the Chamber is working on or yeah, with the city. Give you a little update on that. So on the first issue of regionalizing health care, um, there, there hasn't we do sort of have one regional option, which is what's called the, the Massachusetts, uh, the GIC, which is a state-run health uh, plan that many state workers are on and now local municipalities are looking at and can move into. Um, and that gives you that advantage of buying, you know, larger pool, greater buying power. Um, we've looked at the GIC, as it's called. Some, a lot of communities in the eastern part of the state have decided to their municipal insurance into the GIC because they've been able to, to yield really good savings. Um, and then there's been new legislation that's been passed recently to help streamline the process of doing that because it's a very complicated process that involves collective bargaining, etc. Um, I've looked at the numbers uh, for, we've, and we've looked at it from year to year. The GIC has generally not been a big savings for Northampton because again, we've been really aggressive about changing our plans and raising our co-pays. Uh, co I mean, you have some, I think I'm trying to think, one of the towns in, near Boston just recently moved to the GIC. They were, they had uh, employees that went to like Mass General and had like $5 co-pays. So, I mean, we already have like 20 and 30 and $50 co-pays. So we've raised a lot of our co-pays already in order to keep our plan costs down. There is a Hampshire County, um, it's run through the COG, health plan that we've also looked at. Again, the savings has not really been there for us to move in. Mm -hmm. There have been other complications about the flexibility of the plan, um, retirees, uh, some of the other issues. So, but I'm definitely looking at, and including the GIC, because I do feel like if we could change this, broaden the economy of scale so that we have a larger pool, and I think that's what the state's plan is designed to do. Um, the problem is once you move in, you can't move out for three more years, so we would totally lose our flexibility. And if rates did go up, we have no way to, we're stuck. That's what you have. So, um, but it's definitely a discussion not only here, but all around the region. And obviously, the larger discussion about national health care and how we fund health care nationally, you know, 
know, if we could make the improvements there, that would help us all, all around. So that's the healthcare one. Um, the tw uh, there was one before the tourism. What was the one right If we it, potentially doing an override to help fund road okay, repair. Okay, the override. Yeah, so uh, Amherst at, at its town meeting a couple of years ago did do a kind of a debt exclusion override. It's slightly different because they do it at town meeting. Um, uh, in order to borrow a set amount of money, I think they did $6 million, they did a bond, $6 million, just devoted to road projects. Mm -hmm. um, and they used that to do kind of a blitz of some of their major roadways. Certainly it's something we could talk about, that, that, um, and I know the Department of Public Works has talked about this backlog that they have and couldn't use that to chip away at it. I think it's one of those issues where, um, you know, you're debating whether you know, the DBW also has all these other capital needs, sewer, water, infrastructure. They also have a facility that's woefully inadequate that they need to try to figure out a way to upgrade. Um, but it's, it's, it's a good idea and it's something we can talk about. Um, the question is, with all these other needs, not to mention the operating expense needs that we have, is, is weighing that. But it's, a, it's, it's an intriguing idea and obviously Amherst was able to do it, although I will say Amherst did it, they've also done three general Several years, yeah. as, as evidenced by their tax rate and by their people spending. Well, and six million dollars would just be a little niche into what our it's true. deficit and is for roads. It's million. It would just, it would, yeah, it would get a few roads done, but then we'd be paying that off, and we wouldn't. Yeah. It would take a while before we could do the next batch. Right. But, I, but your point's well taken. And then the third one was about Term. tourism. Um, for many years, we were lumped into the Greater Springfield Tourism Bureau. And in the last budget year, uh, Stan Rosenberg and Peter Kokot and some others created a Hampshire Franklin Tourism. They kind of carved us away from that and have now come up with a funding stream from the state where the state has put together. And you may have noticed recently the chamber at one of its big annual breakfasts announced that they were forming kind of a, a regional chamber. Part of it was to tie into this whole regional approach to tourism, to use these state tourism dollars that before used to flow through Springfield. And, you know, so it was all about the Basketball Hall of Fame and, and Dr. Seuss, and so it never quite trickled down to North Hampton to really market Hampshire County um, and the valley, our part of the valley, better. So I know that the Amherst Chamber and the North Hampton Chamber and the Greater Chamber are working on that, um, and obviously we'll do whatever we can to support that effort. Your point's well taken about you know us kind of getting lost in that shuffle of the bigger Pioneer Valley right. um, that tends to focus just on Springfield. So, are there other questions? Yes. Um, just, I'm just wondering when it's really just one pie in the budget, why um, the city side and the school side are always portrayed as two separate things, yeah. and um, do they really have to be? portrayed that way, and if I remember correctly, last year it was either 469 or 489 was moved from the city side to the school side. Yeah. And um, so, and stuff has always happened where the city side versus the school side is kind of portrayed one yeah. against one another within the city, within negotiations, so I'm wondering whether we would save money if it was, like if collective bargaining was all under one blanket, one thing, whether it would be with the city solicitor or other things like that, yeah. might improve morale and a whole bunch of other things. Yeah, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. I, I, I don't like that terminology of city, school, you know, like they're two We all are the city of Northampton. I think the distinction is that the way it's set up under state law is that the school is an independent, they have their own school department committee, so they elect their own governmental body, the school committee. And really the way that our budget process works is, as the mayor, I'm a member of the school committee. I'm one of nine, I'm one of 10 members of the school committee. I have one vote. But I give, I, I give a, a number to the school department, um, which is what I am giving them in terms of their appropriation from the city. And then they have complete control over all the spending decisions that sort of happen within, with that number. Um, the school committee, and the superintendent. Uh, the school committee hires and supervises the superintendent. He or she does not work for the mayor. Um, so and I think part of it was it was structured that way to set it up as an independent. 
don't know if it was about academic freedom, I don't know exactly what it was, but that's the structure that we have in Massachusetts. So we have tried, I will say this, we have done some work uh, to merge some of those functions. So for example, we used to have a separate HR department and the school department and a city HR department. We've merged those. We used to have a separate payroll department in the school department and a payroll department in the city. Um, we've merged those now. Uh, and so we have tried to figure out ways to build in efficiencies, but that overall structure where, and again, this gets up to the state law, um, where you have a school committee uh, that's duly elected as independent of the city council. Um, and, you know, the city council can't even make decisions within the budget of the school department. That's solely left to the school committee. That's why we have an elected body that does that. Um, we, uh, that would be a much bigger issue on a state level of how we organize uh, school districts. But it's fairly common throughout the country how we have the structure. But we have tried to, where we can, we've tried to blend things together. Because again, a lot of these administrative things, it doesn't make sense a city our size to be you know, duplicating efforts and having you know, two payroll departments. Um, so we've worked to try to do those things, but in terms of merging um, the whole thing under one, it, it really would be, that's more of a state-wide uh, issue that we have to deal with. Um, but again, I, I agree with you though, I always hate the us versus them, the city versus school, because at the end of the day, we're all, it's all the city of Northampton, and we're all, it's all you know, taxpayer dollars. And I think everybody cares about the schools, everybody cares about police, fire. Um, we have to figure out a way to, to balance it all out. So thank you, Officer St. Amish, for your question. Um, any other questions or comments? Have I, have I talked to the depth or bored you to death? Do the counselors, do any of you have any questions or comments? Or I want to thank everybody for being here this evening and Mayor uh, told many people about how well this presentation was going to be. And I want to thank you for doing such a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to, uh, just for a minute, um, I've actually followed the city budgets back to David Kramer um, and Harry Chapman. Take it all day. But anyway, uh, and this is uh, the budget presentation that we had at City Council uh, this time with this mayor and Susan Wright has been more detailed and more specific and easier to wrap your hands around than anything I've ever seen for a budget presentation. So the mayor and Susan Wright, the finance director, deserve enormous kudos for what they're doing right now. And he had said that it, uh, during his campaign, he was going to put his own mark on the budget in the city of Northampton, and he has done that. And I know it's not easy because the money just keeps going away. And uh, a lot of the questions that people have asked have stuff that we are things that we've been talking about in committee. So we're all on the same page. We are all on the same page. Education, uh, the state of our roads. Um, I'm from Ward Seven, and some of my roads are are bad. They're awful. So. Um, Anyway, I want to thank the mayor and Susan Wright, who was not here, yes, um, who was a real workhorse also, and uh, Mary Ann Lamarge for putting this all together, and uh, thank everybody for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.